Okay. Yes, let's start the stream and give a couple of minutes. Now. The stream's live now, Paddy, if you want to start. Thank you very much, Ben. Um, welcome, everybody, uh, to the Resources Overview and Scrutiny meeting um, today on the 18th of March, 2021. Um, before we start, I always like to um, to give an idea to those that are streaming um, and members of the public and welcome to them and to give you an idea of the role within local government that this committee has. Uh, this committee's role is to uh, scrutinise decisions uh, made by the Cabinet and to give recommendations where we feel necessary. Um, so, uh, present today are myself, uh, Councillor Paddy Short um, in the chair. I also have Councillors Kate Walsh, Councillor uh, Steve Button, Councillor uh, Andrew Clegg, Councillor Jean Battle, Councillor Tim O'Kane, Councillor Judith Addison, and Councillor Terry Hearn. We also have present to report to the committee are the leader of the council, Councillor Miles Parkinson, Councillor Joyce Plummer, uh, the cabinet member, Joe McIntyre, Lee Middlehurst, and Lindsay Sims. So if we start on agenda item number one. Uh, apologies for absence, substitution, declarations of interest, and dispensation, Susan. Uh, we've received apologies from Councillor Sassis and Councillor Pratt, and we have Councillor Kate Walsh substituting for Councillor Sassis and Councillor Judith Addison for Councillor. Thank you, Susan. If we go on to um, item number two on the agenda, which is the uh, minutes of the last meeting. And this is to submit the minutes of the Resources Overview and Scrutiny Committee held on the 18th of February 2021 for approval as a correct record. If I can have a proposal, please, and a seconder. I propose it. I'm happy to second. Nobody seconded. Go on, Paddy. Second it. Go on, Paddy. Second it. Yes, thanks. Uh, Andrew Clegg, uh, Councillor Clegg, just seconded it. Thank you very much to both of you. Uh, we'll move on to item number three now, which is the uh, additional, the COVID 19 additional funding for government. Uh, this is to submit. Sorry, um, I'd like to invite councillors uh, uh, Plummer and Parkinson or the officers present um, to present the report. Thank you, Chair. COVID-19 additional funding from government. The report sets out the range and divergent nature of the grants the council has received to assist it directly combat the impact of COVID-19 in Einburn. The grants we have received in relation to helping businesses directly will be covered in the next item on the agenda. The grants from government and from government via Lancashire County Council have been welcome, though of course in most cases we have, could have done with more money sooner and with more freedom to use this money as we saw fit to address our local needs. The track and trace grants for people told to isolate are particularly helped in a community like Einburn, where we have lots of people who work in jobs where their employer it will not fund their absence, and individuals on low income face the dilemma of either losing vital money if they self-isolate or of continuing to attend work knowing they would spread the virus. The major issue for the council around these grants has been determined who fits the government criteria for a grant and explaining to lots of people that they are unfortunately not eligible under the government rules. The other concern in the background for us has been the cap imposed by the government on the discretionary screen, which has meant we have faced the potential prospects of turning away otherwise genuine cases, simply because the funding has all been spent. Thankfully, an additional injection of cash by the government at the last minute into the scheme removed this danger in January. And we hope the new funding is sufficient to avoid the situation reoccurring at the end of June 2021, 
when the scheme is due to end. The Town Centre Reopening Fund helped greatly in the summer for the brief period when pubs and shops could reopen. And we provided extensive advice to businesses to help them successfully restart their business. But unfortunately, the rapid rise in coronavirus cases locally across East Lancashire at this time meant this process stalled very quickly. And we re-entered a series of lockdown from which we are still waiting to re-emerge. Once, however, we get the green light that shops, pubs and the high street can reopen, we will move back into sporting an effective relaunch of our town centres across Einburn with grant money. The largest part of the grant funding we have received is dedicated to helping the public deal with the impact of the pandemic. The creation of Heimland Hub by the Council has allowed us to effectively provide widespread support to all those who have needed some kind of help over the last year. This has ensured food and medicine deliveries to those who were shielding, that a friendly and helpful voice has been at the end of the telephone if needed, that the volunteers' effort has been effectively coordinated that there have been sufficient food available across our network of food banks to meet demand. And the key message around COVID-19 has been emphasised locally and hard to reach groups targeted to ensure that they also are aware of what to do and where they can get help. We have also played our role in assisting with the National Track and Trace Scheme following through on difficult to reach individuals to ensure they receive and act upon the requirements to self-isolate. We have supported businesses that are still working with advice and help and how to operate in a COVID secure way and minimise the risk of workplace infections. And where necessary, we have acted with others to deal with breaches of COVID-19 regulations and the grant funding has assisted us in responding to these requirements effectively. This concludes my introduction. I am now happy to answer questions from the committee. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor uh, Plummer, for that. Um, we have, as a committee, prepared several questions to ask you. Um, so I'll go through uh, one at a time. Um, when I finish the question and you've answered it, and then I'll open it to members if they want to ask any other questions based um, around your answer. And um, so the first question will be, uh, regarding the test and trace payments of £500, how is the system scrutinised to avoid fraudulent claims? Thank you, Chair. The Council is following the Department of Health and Social Care guidance on how the system of making an award should operate, taking steps to prevent fraud in the following ways. Before payments are made, we undertake the following checks to ver verify data provided to us by the claimant is correct. One, that the claimant has a valid track and trace ID number and it matches against the NHS database. Two, that the claim has been made within 28 days of the first period of isolation, again checked against the NHS database. Three, that the claimant is working or self-employed. This is checked against HMRC database. Four, that the main scheme claimant, their details match the benefit details at the Department of Work and Pensions. Five, that the bank details provided for payment relates to the claimant. Payment will not be made unless a bank statement is provided. That the claimant has provided the correct national insurance number. That the number on the form is checked against HMIC details. That the claimant cannot work from home and will have a reduction in income due solely to self-isolation. In addition, we also undertake a 10% post-payment check to ensure that there has been a reduction in earnings for the period of isolation. To date, we have not identified any claims that have been paid incorrectly. If this occurred, we would look to recover the grant. Thank you, Chair. 
Thank you very much, Councillor Plummer, for that uh, very detailed answer. And um, we'll go on to, we've got no other question, uh, people putting their hands up. Um, so we'll go to question two. Uh, how much further funding is due for the council to continue test and trace Thank you, Chair. The Council is guaranteed to receive funding up to the 20th of June 2021, but the amounts that we will receive going forward are unknown. This is due to the level being dependent on the number of working residents of Hindman who have been told to stay at home and self-isolate by the NHS Test and Trace or via the NHS COVID-19 app either because they have tested positive coronavirus or have recently been in close contact with somebody who has tested positive. The DHSC have stated they will reimburse the council for any overspend relating to the main scheme and has provided 203,500 to date to meet the cost of grants up to the 30th of June. Given we have paid 185,000 by early March 2021, we expect we will need to call upon the government to provide additional funding in this area. The government has provided 82,500 in discretionary grants of which 35,500 has been paid. This funding is capped and the government has said it will not provide additional funding above this level. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Plummer. Uh, we go on to the uh, third question, please. Um, which town centres were included in the funding for the reopening of town centres? How much of this funding has been spent? And are further funds expected for this? Thank you, Chair. The physical on street promotional materials and social media communications campaign covered the whole of the borough's high streets. Approximately 34,000 was spent on this. The remaining 38,000 is funding the COVID business information officers and three of the roadside COVID messaging sign unit. The total budget of 73,000 will all be spent by the end of the fund date, which is the 30th of June as per the grant conditions. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Plummer. If we move on to question four now, please. Uh, how much of the emergency food supply funding has been spent so far? How many people have food banks helped through the COVID period? Thank you, Chair. All the 127,000 emergency sister grant food and other supplies have been paid by the council to Maundy Grange for onward distribution to the local community. We have not, no precise figure of how many households we have helped over the period. But in January, the Food Solution Network identified that across a network of 11 food banks around 360 food parcels were distributed in a week. This was an average week, then this would equate to 18,000 food parcels distributed since the onset of COVID-19. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Councillor Flommer. I, I just um, would like to make just one quick statement on, on the actual... Um, the, the food banks and the supply of food banks. I'd just like to put it on record and thank you very much for all the volunteers everybody's got involved. It's been a huge effort and it has shown um, once again um, the strength of character of the people we have in our community that have gone out of their way to help people. So it's, it's really been fantastic. So thank you very much to all those involved. Now I'll go on to the uh, next question, which is question five. Uh, who is carrying out the community champion work fund work? And can you provide a brief summary of how this will be carried out? Thank you, Chair. Heimburn Hub are leading on the Community Champion Fund, along with Heimburn Council, Heimburn Leisure and Heimburn and Ribble Valley Council of Voluntary Services. The funding will be used to assist Heimburn Hub 
continue to support residents and the local community in coping with the impact of the pandemic. It will be used to develop effective communications and information around, sorry, preventing the spread of this virus and promoting the take up of the vaccine and used to counter fake news around these areas. Money will also be set aside to assist the voluntary and community organisations disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. Funds will be used to support 1,000 residents with free access to physical activity and a nutrition programme to help them overcome the impact of the virus on their health and well-being and aid their recovery. There will be investment into the volunteer community to improve the range of skills and quality of these people, to enhance the support they can provide to local people and development of the Community Action Network to better respond to the challenges we now face. And work will be undertaken to find an appropriate way to recognise and celebrate volunteers across the community who have made a real difference. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Plummer. Uh, that ends that section um, as an item three. Uh, before we move on to item four, I'd like to give um, another opportunity for any members who have any further questions to Councillor Plummer on item three. No, okay, thank you very much. Um, has any members got any recommendations they wish to put forward? No, that's great. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Plummer will now move on to item four. I would like to ask Councillors Plummer and Parkinson or the officers to report. Thank you, Chair. Financial support for businesses to provide overview and scrutiny with an overview of the financial support for local businesses administered by the Council on behalf of the government during the first 12 months of COVID-19 pandemic. The COVID-19 pandemic has affected businesses nationally through combinations of enforced closures, limited services and decreased footfall as shoppers stayed away from the high street. Smaller businesses in particular have seen a great impact in their ability to trade or continue to provide services. Since March 2020, government has announced a series of grants and reliefs available to businesses, many of which has been delivered by local authorities. By far the most generous of the grants were announced in March 2020. And as the pandemic has developed, local and national changes have created an increasingly complex system of grants and reliefs. Nevertheless, the revenue team has worked tirelessly to ensure that much needed support has been delivered to our local businesses. And at one point being recognised by the business secretary during national address as the fastest lower tier authority to deliver the initial wave of grants. As with many financial support systems, the availability of grants has brought an influx of inquiries, requests for consideration and appeals against determinations where businesses have not met the relevant eligibility criteria. The revenue team has administered these alongside the fast-paced and often short notice guidance provided by the government. To date, businesses in Heimben have received 37 million in local authority administered grants and reliefs. A number of advanced questions are being raised and I will answer them. I would also like to thank personally the staff that are dealing with all these grants. They have worked extremely hard over the last 12 months. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Councillor Plummer. Uh, as before, we have some advanced questions from the committee for yourself. Uh, question number one. Uh, the council was recognised nationally for taking a proactive approach to distributing the Small Business Grant Fund awards. 
and the retail hospitality and leisure grants. Were any grants paid out incorrectly and has any clawback been required? Thank you, Chair. Payments for the FBGF and the RHLG system were predominantly paid by cheque to ensure it was the business that benefited. All cheques were sent out in the registered name held for the business and it was challenged by the business, sorry, and it was challenged by the business justifications sought before any change in the payee could be made. In addition, by paying by cheque meant that the council could stop the cheque if any information came to light before it had been cleared or it was not presented at all, which suggested the business may no longer exist. As payment was made by cheque, this prompted some businesses to notify the council on receipt of the cheque that the business had ceased trading. A small number of businesses came forward stating they believed they should have had a payment and that they met the criteria. For example, a business had moved to or taken over another business. In all cases, checks were made before any payment was made to ensure that only one payment was being made. Due to an administrative delay in banking process for businesses who deposited their SBGF check, payment via the post office rather than into their bank direct due to their banking being closed at the outset of the pandemic. Seven small businesses grant fund SBGF were duplicated. The council's revenue team corresponded with the businesses affected and issued invoices for the recovery of these SBGF payments. All seven have been recovered in full. In addition, a small number of eligible business notified the council that they wished to refuse the SBGF or LHLG grant that they were eligible for. Whilst the council's revenue team determined the business that met the criteria for payment, a separate team within the council created and processed the checks for those eligible businesses. There was a clear trail from separation of duties covering procedure of grant approval, payment, authorization, storage and bank account changes. As SBGF, RHLG payments were initially issued by check the revenues team regularly monitored which business had not cashed their payment. 139 SBGF payments to the value of 1,390,000 were cancelled and four RHLG payments to the value of 100,000 were cancelled. Thank you, Chair. <coughs> Uh, thank you, Councillor Plummer. Um, there's no further questions on that uh, on that question. So we'll move on to number two, please. Uh, some small businesses have spoken to councillors about difficulty with paperwork and bureaucracy when applying for grants. How has the council helped small businesses or sole traders who may have difficulty with the required paperwork? Have the council learned lessons? which it can apply to future business grants, should anything like this occur again. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. As the government guidance on the local restriction support grant scheme does not specify a national or standard application process that every local authority can adopt. It is the decision of each local authority to how they wish to administer the LRSG and similar business support schemes. The government guidance line says, the government will not accept deliberate manipulation and fraud and any business caught falsifying their records to gain additional grant money will face prosecution. 
and any funding issued will be recovered as may any grants paid in error. Local authorities have continued to ensure the safe administration of grants and that appropriate measures are put in place to mitigate against the increased risk of both fraud and payment error. In this respect, grant administrators should consider supplementing existing controls with digital tools to support efficient, appropriate and accurate grant awards. The government also expects local authorities to implement prepayment and postpayment assurance measures. To deliver this assurance requirement, local th th authorities should develop pre and post payment assurance plans for grant scheme. This would be an eligibility check and receipt check on all payments, whether pre or post. The plan should set out the actions and check local authorities that will undertake to a certain regularity of payments. This should cover the prepayment checks for grants still to be paid, but also the post payment assurance checking regime that the local authority will introduce to identify irregular payments. The Council's revenue team developed and implemented its own online application process for each of the various LR SG schemes. The use of online applications are common business practice for areas such as applications for universal credit, submitting business HMRC tax returns, register business for VAT and for taxing a vehicle with DVLA. In addition, the types of business in Hindman that were subject to localised and national restrictions varied. As Hindman moved from Tier 3, local restrictions from the 17th of October 2020, into the national restrictions from the 4th of November, and into Tier 3 restrictions from the 3rd of December 2020 and tier four restrictions from the 31st of December. The application form was updated to ensure that the council captured all relevant information. As the various LRSG grants are subject to state aid level, the use of an application form process for each scheme ensures that the council were recording the declaration from the business that the award of the grant would not exceed state aid levels. Adopting the use and of application form for each scheme minimises the risk of fraud and error in the administration of the schemes. However, since the onset of tier four restrictions from the 31st of December, and the continued national restrictions from the 5th of January 2021 to the 31st of March 2021, the Council's revenue team have implemented a single application form for the administration of LRSG and the additional one-off closed business lockdown payment, CBLP. The LRSG for the period 31st December 2020 to the 15th of February 2021 is calculated at a different rate to that of the period from the 16th of February 2021 to the 31st of March 2021. The Council issued payments automatically for the period of the LRSG 16th of February 2021 to the 31st of March 2021 for those businesses who had already applied for the LRSG and the CBLP for the period 31st of December 2020 to the 15th of February 2021. As the, council, as the council, sorry, had confided that it held an accurate list of those businesses that were mandated to close and that government did not vary the type of business mandate 
to close while national restrictions continued. With regard to the online application form that the Council designed for use with the Local Business Discretionary Grant, the LBDG, the LRSG Open and the Additional Restriction Grants, the ARG Scheme, the application form provided a one-side-fits-all approach in order for business of all sizes in all business sectors to complete. The application form and the submission of relevant information appropriate for their business to demonstrate how their business set the council's eligibility criteria. As the LBDG and the LRSG open and the ARG schemes require businesses to demonstrate how the impact of the pandemic may have affected their business, the level of information required was in line with the government guidance outlines. The Council's revenue team have provided assistance and guidance over the telephone and by responding to written inquiries with regard to eligibility criteria for the various LRSG schemes and the type of information that a business or a trader would have reasonably had available to them to support their application. The team had also used their local knowledge of businesses in Heimben to provide guidance on the type of information and supporting evidence that a business may be reasonably able to provide in support of any application form. The Council also provided template guidance for, for specific business sectors, for example, taxi drivers, private hire drivers, of what type of information and supported evidence that business could provide to fully complete their application. May I add to that that uh, Mr Middleton was extremely helpful to the taxi drivers with that form. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you very much, Councillor Plummer. Uh, we'll move on to question three. Uh, what checks are carried out on businesses for fraudulent claims? Thank you, Chair. With regard to the SBGF scheme, one of the main eligibility criteria was that the business was entitled to small business rate relief. During 2019, the business revenue teams had undertaken a full review of all businesses that were entitled to SBRR. And the revenue teams had confidence in the accuracy of the business rates caseload as at 11th of March 2020, when this scheme was launched. In addition, the council undertook individual checks of around a further 400 businesses for eligibility for the SBGF scheme. For businesses where it was not clear that the use of the premises was for business use or personal use. The Council's revenue teams, working together with internal audit, developed a risk assessment matrix to identify any proportionate risks in the administration of the grant scheme. In addition, the Council's revenue team undertake post-payment checks in relation to the eligibility for the grant schemes. The risk assessment and post-payment assurance checks have been developed based on the guidance issued by local authorities got by the government. For each of the scheme where a business has been required to complete an application form, the council undertakes reasonable and proportionate checks with regard to the business, which includes, but not limited to, company's house registration, government grants management function, digital due diligence tool spotlight, HBC business rates record, HBC environmental services records, 
HBC licensing records, requests for supporting evidence such as audited or certified company accounts, bank account details. Thank you, Chair. <coughs> Thank you again, uh, Councillor Plummer. Uh, now move on to question four. Were the self-employed eligible for the local business discretionary grant? Thank you, Chair. All business sectors, including self-employed individuals, were able to submit applications for the local business discretionary grant scheme, LRSG Open, and for the additional restriction grant scheme. For each of the various grant schemes, the Council has widely publicised their availability through the local media, the Council website, the Council's social media channels, as well as various businesses and entities, i.e. Chamber of Trade, HBC Markets Manager. The Council's revenue team has also emailed businesses direct to notify them of the launch of the application process for LRSG schemes and ARG schemes. Thank you, Chair. Thank you again, Councillor Plummer. Um, question five, please. How many businesses who apply for the discretionary scheme did not receive a grant? Thank you, Chair. Local Business Discretionary Grant Scheme. 30 applicants did not qualify as they did not provide relevant supporting information or did not meet the Council's eligibility criteria. LRSG Open Scheme. 10 applicants did not qualify as they did not meet the Council's eligibility criteria. Additional Restriction Grants, Phase 3. 13 applicants did not qualify as these businesses were eligible for LRSG Closed and CPLP for the period current national restrictions. And the Council prioritised applicants for ARG Phase 3 that were not entitled to the LRSG closed and the CBLP. Additional restriction grants, phase four. 12 applicants did not qualify as these businesses were eligible for the LRSG closed and the CBLP for the period of current national restrictions. And the council prioritized applicants for ARG phase three that were not entitled to the LRSG closed and the CBLP. Correspondence was issued by the council's revenue team to all businesses that did qualify for business support. In addition, businesses that did not meet the criteria for certain grant support was advised of the reason and encouraged to make inquiries regarding other government financial support in relation to the COVID-19. Details which can be found online at government.uk corona stroke business support. Thank you, Chair. Well, thank you, uh, Councillor Plummer. Regarding the additional uh, restriction support grant, how was eligibility, in other words, criteria set for this fund? Thank you, Chair. The, the Council developed its ARG scheme based on government guidelines issued for the ARG. Cabinet approved the ARG policy under emergency powers on the 3rd of December 2020. Thank you, Chair. Well, thank you, Councillor Plummer. Um, the next question is, do we know how many businesses have closed as a result 
of the pandemic. If not, does the council intend to do any work to determine how many businesses have closed? Thank you, Chair. Information in respect to businesses that have closed a result of the pandemic is unknown by the council. However, as an indication, the number of empty properties recorded on the council's non-domestic rate system as of 1st of March 2020 was 520. The number of empty properties recorded on the council's non-domestic rate system on the 1st of March 2021 was 481. The council's policy team may look to undertake an exercise in relation to this. Thank you, Chair. Chair. I thank you very much, Councillor Plummer. So the final question for yourself is, has the council received sufficient support from the government to carry out all the additional work required to support businesses as a result of the pandemic? Thank you, Chair. Yes, government has provided new burdens funding to local authorities in relation to the administration of the various grant schemes and business support schemes that have been implemented by the Council since the start of the pandemic. Thank you, Chair. Once again, I would like to thank the revenue staff for all the hard work they've done throughout this period. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Councillor Plummer. Have we got any uh, further questions based on the, the COVID-19 business support from committee members? Okay, I see no hands. Um, so is there any recommendations that committee members wish to put forward? No, okay, great. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Plummer. Um, thank you very much for all your... I know it's a very, very complex subject with the ARGs and the DA and so on. Um, but as a chair of the committee, I would also like uh, if you would pass on our thanks and our gratitude towards the uh, council of workers um, that have dealt with all the business grants as they've come in. Um, I understand it has been extremely hectic. Um, they've done a fantastic job. Um, so many thanks to them because um, a lot of businesses in the in the borough um, have survived because of um, due partly to their hard work. So uh, please pass that on and thank you very much for your detailed uh, report and your detailed um, answers to our questions. And we are now going to uh, item five on the agenda, which is uh, the Hindburn Leisure Update Report. Um, I'd like to welcome uh, Lindsay Sims, who is the uh, Chief Executive of Hindburn Leisure, uh, to present the report. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so the report that you've received in advance of today's meeting um, highlights a number of different themes, um, starting with the, the position that the Trust has been in over the last 10 to 11 years to move down to a financial sustainability position. Um, you'll note in the, the table that I shared in the report that as an organisation, we used to be funded by the council um, to the tune of over £1.2 million per year. Um, we've worked uh, in collaboration with the council to reduce that figure um, and the 2021 uh, management agreement was due to be £90,000 um, and no agreements in place for this future um, financial year as well. You'll see in the graph that I shared as well in the report that during that period, um, so the overall amount that's been saved through that period is over 8.7 million. And alongside that, the Leisure Trust has worked very differently to become much more commercially focused to turn over fees and charges revenue of an extra 83% during that period. So we've gone from um, having a real dependency on the council and that management fee, which was almost half of our overall turnover, to yeah. now um, increasing, increasing yeah. income by 1.2 million. Um, and having a much smaller percent of that overall turnover coming from the grant, from the management fee. We've also as well um, increased visits to the local facilities and introduced new programmes around health and wellbeing, particularly focused on people with long-term conditions and additional needs. 
And we've managed as well, we haven't really changed our pricing structures very much during that period because we recognise that to encourage people to become active, we need to make that affordable for people. We do have um, reductions in place for, for certain people as well to make sure it's even more accessible. So I, I also want to just highlight that the increase in turnover is very much as a result of more people being active and using those facilities, which is what is our intention as an organisation. You'll see from the report as well, we've um, invested over that period over £2 million into maintenance and renovations across the leisure estate. On average, we, we invest around £180,000 a year into maintaining facilities, which will include things like statutory checks, health and safety um, information, but also fixing things that need repairs and in some cases renovating and purchasing new items to improve the office to residents as well. The journey that we've been on, um, you know, saving the £8.7 million collective has meant that we haven't been able to um, develop cash reserves. We haven't been able to grow those because we've been absorbing the reductions year on year. Um, and that means that it's a more competitive and it's more difficult when competitors come into the marketplace or other things affect us. And obviously, we've just had a year like no other, which we wouldn't anticipate and wouldn't expect again, hopefully. Um, but that has meant that the, the result of that is we haven't had the cash reserves to be able to ride that wave this year. Um, we'll continue, and we always have um, played a key role in the preventative agenda around improving health and wellbeing for the borough. And we are a local employer as well. So 73% of our employees live in Hindburn. Um, almost all of them, 98%, live in the Pennine Lancashire area. And nearly half of our employees as well are under the age of 25. So we do employ a lot of young people in the borough as well. Um, and obviously we are we're a company, but we're also a not-for-profit charity. So no shareholders, just um, voluntary trustees so all profits that we make are reinvested back into the facilities and back into the borough. So in terms of the past year um, this is um, a different update so this is my third one I've done since I've been in Hindburn and um, the financial impact of Covid has been quite um, devastating for the leisure sector and uh, particularly for the leisure trust sector. Um, we have been closed for almost eight months of the financial year um, and for the four months that we were open we were open under restrictions as well. So as you can imagine, it's been, a, it's been a very challenging year, difficult for our employees and also for our customers as well, who've been very keen to get back into facilities. And during that time, um, we have accessed um, different sort of support mechanisms, but we also have um, ongoing costs. So running um, large buildings that with you know ongoing maintenance and, and utility costs are still there. So there has been expenditure needs, albeit lower than they would have been normally. Um, you'll note in the report, this is um, not just a high an issue. The district um, district council's network has forecast that collectively leisure centres will be in deficit of around £305 million this year across the country. Um, there is an awful lot of lobbying that continues to take place. Um, and at the end of last year, we've, we've discovered that there was a £100 million fund launched for the public, um, so the, the leisure trust sector. So we were notified in Hindman that our allocation of that was £160,000, which we applied for and we've recently found out that we were successful. We also very recently found out that we've been given a top-up payment of just over £10,000 in addition to that as well. So it goes some way to support him, but it doesn't go anywhere near what we really need as a sector. So in Section 3, in terms of managing that operating deficit, um, we have, as you see there, our largest income area is fitness. Um, we are anticipating um, a huge income loss this year because of the lockdown um, during the periods. And we expect that our income from fees and charges will be down by about 90 percent, which equates to nearly two million pounds. Um, so we've put a lot of mitigating um, sort of actions in place to make sure that the situation is improved. Um, some of those were redeploying people like myself to the Hindman Hub and other colleagues as well. We have also been redeployed to work as COVID marshals at the vaccination centre. Um, a lot of our, well, the vast majority of our team have been furloughed on 80% of pay during those eight months of uh, lockdown. We've um, applied for the, a lot of the grants, um, all the grants that were available to us, um, that was been mentioned on the previous item, and also for extra health related funding as well. We have been successful to receive a few grants on that too. Um, that mentioned the National Leisure Recovery Fund, so we have been successful with that. And we've negotiated contracts throughout as well, particularly for things that we're not using maintenance contracts and others to, to reduce those during the period. So um, 
the house been an awful lot done and um, but at the moment we are still looking we're still probably going to be the middle of april until we know the exact position of the impacts of covid but as you know throughout the financial year the council has been proposing uh, a one-off payment of up to nine hundred thousand pounds to the trust obviously the monies that we get through from national um recovery fund will, will be offset against that and the intention is if there's anything outstanding over and above that, that the trust would take on a loan to pay for that so that we're sharing the burden of the, the situation this last year. And also we will continue alongside the council to lobby to see if the sector can get any more support um, from central government. In terms of moving forward from this, um, we are ready to open on the 12th of April, um, earlier for, for outdoor activities. So we'll be opening at the end of March for football and for athletics. Um, and Mercer Hall Ledge Centre and Hindman Ledge Centre will be open from the 12th of April. And we're hopeful that the roadmap that's been identified will allow us to, to open all services up, in particular the Town Hall as well, where we've obviously seen a loss of revenue from events and, and weddings and such as well. Um, but we, we are hearing really good things. We're getting a lot of inquiries through and people seem keen to, to get back into socialising and, and, and celebrating as well. Our main focus is around the recovery are going to be around health and wellbeing and capital development. So we, um, as an organisation, we are growing the number of services that we deliver through grant schemes. And um, we've got a great track record of that. And we also feel that by growing that area, we're less reliant on fees and charges income, which is what we found this year, because we have such a great kind of reliance on that because we don't have a management fee that's large. Um, it's had a huge impact on us because we so we so kind of need that in income from fees and charges. The other side as well around capital development, obviously we're working very closely with the council to look at the leisure transformation and the future of the leisure estate across Hindburn. Um, that work is still some way to go, um, but one part of that that we know has been successful was a grant that was made in January to the Public Sector Decarbonisation Scheme. So almost £2 million of investment is now um, been awarded to Time and Leisure Centre. That work will have a great effect in terms of reducing the carbon output on that centre. So it's estimated to reduce it by 74%. Um, sadly, our customers won't notice that it's um, a £2 million investment because it's going to be things like air source heat pumps, um, new air handling systems, really, really essential things for a building of that age. Um, and that will also as well go some way towards the ambition to refurbish that facility fully for the future as well. In addition to that, the Trust are working with Lancashire Environment Fund um, for our community hubs. We've already received funding this year and carried out work at Bank Mill House. And we've got applications in for Clayton Civic Hall and for West End Community Centre as well in Oswald Whistle. I'm very excited as well. Um, just recently it was announced that Clayton Amateur Boxing Club are going to be relocated to Clayton Civic Hall as well. So the, the, Lan so the Lancashire Environment Fund work, the, the boxing club and the decarbonisation work is our focus for capital development this year. Um, the other side, the broader side of the transformation is more a visionary um, and much more kind of exercise to, to get, gather all the e public consultation information as well. So in terms of um, where we see the, the forecast position for the Trust over the next year, the next three years, at present we are putting together the, um, the forecast budget for 21-22. Um, as you can imagine, it's quite a difficult challenge, still lots of unknowns. Um, we are we are going to be taking that to our board in April, so we'll have the final um, final bu budget for next year. Um, there are things in there, things like um, a hope that the National Leisure Recovery Fund will have around two. We are hearing positive things from Sport England, but until it's um, confirmed, we can't have any guarantees. But obviously that will improve things. And we're also we have a different model of operating, which is going to allow us to just to grow the services as we as we can. Obviously, furlough and business grants will continue for some months, and we'll make sure we capitalise on that as well in the, in the first half of the year. Um, we also recognise that we could have further social distancing rest restrictions and other things, and we need to budget and plan for that as well. So, as you can imagine, a very complex process, but it's one that we are um, approaching in a really um, ambitious way so we are aiming to be realistic but we want to to challenge ourselves to get back to where we were heading um, prior to the pandemic so that brings it a close to the um, the update i believe there are some questions uh, thank you very much uh, lindsay um and before we begin we've got we've got three questions um um, I'd like to thank, obviously, again, you, you and your team. Um, it has been challenging times for everybody. 
Um, I, I'm not sure how you and your team have got through this, to be honest, um, because of, of all industries, yours has pretty much just completely been de decimated and stopped. Um, obviously, no income, etc. Um, and also, when, when you think that how important it is uh, for the physical and mental uh, well-being of our residents, so it, it is of the utmost importance. Um, I'm sure when this is over, and you can, you look forward to a holiday, <laughs> I'm pretty sure of that. Um, so I have three questions for you. I do note uh, Councillor um, um, O'Kane has his hand up. Uh, Councillor O'Kane, if it's okay, I, I'll come to you after uh, Lindsay um, answers the, the first three questions, if that's okay. Um, so the first question, please, is um, the council um, has reduced the annual grant to the Leisure Trust down to £90,000 whilst continuing to invest capital funding in the trust buildings. Is this working as a business model? Thank you. Um, as I've mentioned, um, it, it was a planned reduction and it has been done in collaboration, so it's over a 12 year period. I'd say what it has done, um, first and foremost, is it's made the trust become a, an extremely efficient leisure provider um, nationally. We're being told that quite frequently when we, when we meet with um, national industry experts. Um, it's made us sharpen our commercial focus as well. So you've seen we've you know, double turnover from visa charges during that period. Um, it hasn't been straightforward. It has required a high level of innovation and hard work, um, but we are proud of the reductions that we've been able to achieve. And we are ambitious to become a financially sustainable organisation that, that is a standalone and um, working very closely with the council. Um, because obviously that's, you know, reduces the public subsidy and the cost for local people. Um, the buildings themselves obviously are owned by Hyndman Borough Council, so we have leases on each of those buildings around repairs and maintenance. And the responsibility um, of Hyndman Leisure is to make sure things keep on functioning. So if things break down, we will fix them. If they need replacing, the council will replace them you know, for larger items, and that's built into the lease. So where you see capital investment going in from the council, occasionally that's because something needs completely replacing. So if a roof needed fixing or replacing, that would be done by the council, and that's key in the, in the lease. Um, the other types of capital investment the, the council has put into the Leisure Trust over the last probably six or seven years have been focused on areas that will improve our commerciality. So, um, for, in, for instance, things like Adventure City, which helps to improve the profitability of Hyman Leisure Centre and um, the, the feel good suites as well. At both of the, the leisure centres have also helped to increase um, turnover as well. So in that essence, they, they have been very successful investments from the council. And um, what we're going to now, obviously, is to look at a bigger, wider scheme, which is for the future. Um, so that that's, you know, has a different different impact. It would um, it would be great if we could bring more income into the trust if there were other grants. But we are very, very focused on making sure that we remain as independent as we possibly can and, and reduce the public outlay for, for finance into, into the trust organisation. That's great. Thank you very much for that answer. Um, I don't see any hands up. Obviously, Councillor Keen will come to the end of it. Um, so um, if we go on to uh, question number two, please. Uh, the council is proposing a one-off payment of £900,000 to cover in-year COVID-related losses. Will a further grant would be required next year while the trust obviously is still recovering? Thanks for that. Um, so as I mentioned in my uh, my report, we are working up the, the forecast budget for 21-22, so we're yet to fully confirm that. Um, there is, it is going to be challenging um, and it's going to be dependent on a number of factors. We are hopeful that we won't need to come back to the council in 21-22 for additional monies, but obviously that's difficult to judge at the moment. We're also um, hopeful that we'll get some money from the National um, Leisure Recovery Fund. And if that does come into fruition, that would make things far, far um, more kind of positive for the trust in our financial position. So at the moment, we are not anticipating to come back to the council. But obviously, we don't know what the future brings. If it's, it's a straightforward roadmap, then we stand a much stronger chance of doing that if there are further lockdowns and the, the pandemic continues for more, um, more months to come. then obviously, that will affect us as well. Thank you very much. Uh, the third question, um, I, to be honest, I think we've, we've you pretty much covered it, but I'll ask you if you wanted to add anything, and that is, uh, what is Hyndburn Leisure's forecast for next year? Yeah, so I've just repeated um, what I've just said. It's um, 
to, to be confirmed, we will have a picture of that next month. So we can we will share obviously with officers who meet them on a monthly basis. That's great. Um, that, that's the end of um, the questions that we'd already uh, put together, uh, the committee put together. But I noticed um, uh, Councillor O'Kean has, has a question. So if, um, if you'd like to ask it to Lindsay now, Councillor O'Kean. Hi, hi, Lindsay. It's uh, just a bit of context before I, uh, before I ask the, uh, the questions. I mean, you know, the, uh, the purpose of scrutiny is, of course, to scrutinise. But we have to scrutinise everything, including any proposals which are put forward, which might affect your planning. And given that, I mean, I'm happy, you know, having read through the report, it's innovative and you're doing a, a great job in extremely uh, challenging circumstances. But I have to turn to the uh, Conservative proposals which they said were fully costed and I'm just wondering who who's done this full costing so there's basically there's uh, there's four questions about uh, this what consultations were carried out bearing in mind this they're talking about a million pound investment into the uh, into the uh, the scheme to avoid the uh, the closure of uh, of Mercer Baths, so what consultations were carried out? And I would have thought that you would have known, you being the uh, the head honcho, as to speak. Was a million pound actually enough to solve the problems at uh, at Mercer Baths to the extent that they can safely open again? What's the impact on the bid for Wilson's playing fields, which you're, you're running, you know, you refer to it in the report? You know, I, I think it's going to have a, a detrimental effect on it, you know, if you've got to keep uh, an, another facility uh, open and you've got to keep plowing uh, money into it. And I think it's more or less been uh, answered uh, about how would you uh, manage to keep paying for this? I think it would be a millstone around your, your neck. So do you have any? Yeah, um, just on, on the first point, um, obviously we, we have had um, a number of different studies done on the three leisure sites that are being considered around the proposals. Um, they highlighted over £3 million of um of works that would be needed to done to just replace equipment and such like. Um, doesn't we haven't get got to the stage where we've had a detailed costing for any of the facilities. So I don't personally have that and I haven't shared that with anybody because it's not available at this time. So I can, you know, it, it could be that people are just making an assumption based on the condition survey information that was shared in the cabinet report, but no detailed designs or costings have been given for any of the sites at the moment. We're not at that stage. That's, you know, I think the assumption sometimes at the moment is that things have already been decided, um, but we're at a public consultation phase now, and that will help mm -hmm. to shape how things move forward. So we wouldn't get necessarily through to the, the kind of the, the costings and the actual drawings of buildings until we've gone through that phase. Um, so I hope that answers your first one. We, we don't yet know mm -hmm. what those costings would be. Um, in terms of the, the impact on the sites, I think, um, as I've mentioned, we're reopening Mercer Hall Leisure Centre on the 12th of April. We were due to open it in January, but obviously we went into lockdown. Um, we are using some of the National um, Leisure Recovery Fund to help to fund that to recover. That's what, in essence, what that's, that's what the fund's there for, to cover any deficit for a few months. Um, if that comes through further down into the year as well, that'll help us to, to get that facility back up and running. Uh, we are at a lower membership base now than when we went into the pandemic last May, sorry, last March. So we are going to have a challenge, um, but we're opening it with the gym and the feel good suite at the moment and then hope to introduce the group exercise and thermal suite as soon as we can. We are expecting um, some concrete surveys to come back this week and um, possibly next week at the, at the latest. And that will indicate whether it's safe for the building to, to refill that pool. But as people know, it is leaking a considerable amount of water. 
um, and further investigation works and lots uh, more investment would be needed to, to solve that problem. It's been an ongoing problem for a number of decades, actually. So, um, so there are challenges there, but we will aim to see if we can if we can function that building as a kind of a covering its cost as a dry site initially. So we'll, we'll be testing that out this year. So that'll be really interesting for us to see how that works. Um, for our board of trustees, we're going to be sharing on a regular basis how that's going. And obviously, if a decision needs to be made in the year, um, we will make that. But we'd hope not to have to, and particularly if there's um, some national some national recovery funding to help with that. In terms of the, the impact of that on the proposals, um, obviously the proposals are to replace Mercer Hall Leisure Centre. So that's the industry kind of expert's opinion. Um, because they feel that, that that would be a better thing for the borough going forward. Um, Wilson's has been identified as the proposed location for that. So obviously, if it was a refurb project, it would be quite different because that's what they're proposing for Hindman Leisure Centre. So as we're not yet through the final um, proposals, and obviously that will come to Cabinet and to full council in the future, um, it's difficult to say, Tim. But um, I think I would say that um, you probably wouldn't have both particularly for two pools because what the um the national run report said for some pools was that the um the replacement pool will give us more water space in hind but then that will meet need so you wouldn't want to put more than you actually need you know you want you'd want to meet that demand rather than um exceed it so that you you're having facilities that are running at a cost yeah okay thanks that seems to settle the thing about this mythical million quid uh, things so I might have a, a, another question about uh, a number of lanes in the pools and that but I'll, I'll let others uh, come in Thank Yeah thank, thank you Councillor uh, O'Keean and, and thank you very much Lindsay for that I, I've just got a quick question on it Lindsay um, that has just popped into my head and you'll be able to clarify it um, with the building of, of, of Wilson's um, I take it um, the way we build the pool, etc., will allow us to uh, apply for funding from Sports England, um, which may not obviously be the case at Mercer Hall because it has to has to be certain size and certain criteria. Is, is there some truth in that? Um, yes, yeah, Sport England have been working with us on this since January 2019. Um, they are really quite excited by the Wilson site, actually. Um, they're, they're pleased with the idea of refurbing Hyman Ledge Centre as well, but their strategy and um, one of the key areas of their strategy is around active environments. So the, the real bonus of, of having that um, that site is that you have got the athletics track, the woodland trail, the canals, the football pitches, the rugby club, the base there, the park run and others as well. So it gives that opportunity to really focus on it being a hub of activity and um, not just a leisure centre. So a much, much broader space which fits within their remit. Uh, I think the Mercer proposition would be um, less attractive to them um, because it doesn't give that opportunity to grow the offer that's currently there. It's not to say they'd say no if that's what we, the public consultation and everything went back and you know construction information says something different. But at the moment, they just seem really excited by that proposition and they can fund up to £2 million into a project as well overall. So it's it's important, and and added to that, they have got fantastic expertise. They, they deliver and support these types of projects up and down the country, um, all year long. So we want to take their advice. Yeah, great. Thanks for that, and and it sounds really exciting. I think I think you can see that you're excited about it, and I think we're excited as a council about it um, to bring those kind of facilities, especially with, with with Sports England on board and the grants and the money and the expertise they can bring to, which you've already covered. Uh, I've got another question there uh, from Councillor Waltz. Thank you, Chair. Um, seeing as we're talking about expanding our leisure facilities, I uh, wanted to ask a question on um, if, if there is a possibility of emulating Blackburn's Bees card seat, uh, Bees card scheme. And now I know that we do have some schemes here in Hindburn, um, but you often have to have a qualifying benefit um, to access the schemes. Um, Blackburn's Bees Cards is open to all residents and workers in, in, in Blackburn. And because of that, it does mean that we lose out on some of our leisure business because those residents from Hindburn that work in Blackburn often use the free or subsidised sessions in Blackburn instead of coming to their own leisure facilities here in Hindburn. Um, 
and I think that in a borough like Highburn with high levels of poverty, uh, families and single people that, that may not be able to afford to access the facilities, I just think that it would be a, a good thing to maybe consider. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Walsh. Um, I think that's a really good suggestion and something that I can go away and look at with my team. Um, obviously, in one of the earlier reports, it mentioned the Community Champions Fund. We've got a thousand free places for people across the borough. Um, but coming out of the COVID pandemic, there's a lot of people who are not just affected by the health and wellbeing, but also financially be affected as well. So if we can look at something to help people to move into exercise, I think that's a great thing. Uh, one of the pieces of work we did as part of the Leisure Transformation early on as well was to do some mosaic modelling to look at who uses the facilities, so which parts of our community, which residents, you know, are using them. So if we could use that, you know, to, to look at targeting some of those people who might not normally access us as well, that would be a great outcome for us. So, yeah, I'll take that away and have a look into that with my team. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lindsay, again. Um, I, I, anybody else have any questions? Obviously, um, the, the Heimburn Leisure, um, not only about the questions about um, uh, Pacific, anything Pacific, but, you know, any part of their portfolio, buildings, etc. cetera. Um, sorry, Councillor Keane, you've still got your hand up. Do you want to ask another question? Yeah. So, Councillor Keane, it was about the, uh, the actual uh, Wilson's uh, playing bid. Um, I'm taking up from uh, what Councillor Cass Pratt uh, mentioned at uh, an earlier meeting. Um, it mentions in it about a four-lane pool. But from what I understand, I know it's uh, it's an early part of the uh, the bid. But would it not make more uh, sense to go for a, a five-lane pool or six-lane pool? I know it will be uh, extra costs uh, onto the bid, but given that, uh, you know, if we're trying to encourage competitive swimming, you can't do that, apparently, on a, a four-lane pool. So I just wondered if you could clear that up. Of course, yeah. yeah. I think um, that has come through. We've, we've had a clubs forum as part of the public consultation. We've spoken to some of the clubs um, and that's that's a concern of people that use Great Harwood Pool already. Um, what I'd say as well is, obviously, we know that the Mercer Hall Leisure Centre Pool is not a conventional pool. Um, so it's actually the same width as a four lane pool would be going into, mm -hmm. proposed to go into Clayton. But we fit five lanes into the, the pool at Mercer. So the, the club that uses that pool would, for Garland, would have five lanes, which would obviously make it more suitable for competitions. At the moment, the the four lane has, has come out through the um, you know through the needs assessment based on the bum report to say that actually we've got a six lane pool at Accrington Academy, a five lane pool at Hindburn Academy with spectator seating already. So it's just based on what they what they see the need is for Hindburn. We take into consideration in that report as well all the boroughs outside of us as well and the demand and the, the opportunities that are there. Um, so I think that. It, it, I don't. I don't have any doubt that it's going to be considered because it's been raised and it should be. Obviously, we'll, we'll look into it. Um, but I would, what I would say also is that um, growing your pool space increases your costs significantly. So yeah. that's another consideration for us. And something yeah. else that's come forward as um, as a suggestion is that we look at improving access at that site in particular. So one of the things that could be considered is that the water could be slightly warmer. Um, because we have swimming pools for people that are lane swimming and um, not necessarily appropriate for people that have got arthritic conditions or for young children who might start to turn blue after you know, being in there for 20 minutes or so because we don't have a learner pool. So there is an opportunity for us to look at having a pool that's got a different purpose as well with easier access into the pool as well for people with disabilities and additional needs. So I think all those things have got to be considered because competitive swimmers won't want to use a pool that's slightly a degree or too warmer because it was too hot for them. Um, no. So we just need to, to look at all the options. Uh, but like just to reiterate, we're at that stage now where there's an awful lot of interest, which is fantastic. We've had over 500 responses already to the survey, which launched last Thursday. And um, so the more involvement we can get from residents and from elected members and other stakeholders, the better, because it'll help us to shape a really, really fantastic future opportunity and offer for the borough. Yeah. I particularly like the uh, the fact that it's on the uh, the Heinburn circular bus route. Yeah. 
because uh, you know when you're looking at uh, the costs for, for children, you know it it, it might seem a, a very small thing, but it's a uh, it's it's a factor for a lot of young children and uh, teenagers as well. You know, yeah, absolutely. More power to you. Great. Uh, thank you, Councillor um, Councillor O'Kean. Um, Lindsay, I, I think that um, as that basically ends um, the Hindburn Leisure Update report. Um, thank you very much for coming again, and thank you for um, all your information you shared with us today. Um, I would like to please uh, pass on all, all your th thanks from the council to your team for the, the hard work we've done over an extremely difficult time. And, um, you know, exciting times ahead by the sounds of it, um, which is really, really great. So thanks again. Thank you. Uh, just, just to finish off uh, the meeting, has any of the councillors um, any recommendations that they'd like to put forward on the whole meeting today? No? Okay. So that uh, basically ends the meeting. Thank you very much for everybody for, um, for, for coming today and to members of the public um, especially. I know it's a, an extremely um, complex um, meeting um, with all these ARGs and SDPs and opens and etc. cetera. Um, but it's, um, I brought it forward because I thought it was extremely important um, with all these grants to ensure that we uh, scrutinize them properly uh, because these grants are pretty much what's going to keep our local economy and jobs within the um, local area. So thank you very much for everybody. Um, so, and I will see you in the next meeting. Thank you, Paddy. Thank you very much.